Okay, so yeah, we're going to change, I, I think, a little bit about, about um, you know, what's been happening during the day. So, so far we've been talking a lot about biological vision and how the human brain is um, interpreting the the images or maybe the, the, the intensities that it's perceiving and turning those into meaningful depths. Um, um, and now, you know, it's for, for me, it's going to be much more about we've got some images that have been acquired by a camera. So these are definitely 2D images. Uh, they're digital images. Um, and we're trying to then perceive the world in, in 3D. So we're going, we're definitely in this case going from two-dimensional images uh, to three-dimensional models. Um, and as Rich says, really what's captured my imagination for, for many years in research is how do we capture the 3D geometry of objects that are, that are changing their geometry over time, so dynamic objects, objects that are deforming, or when we're looking at scenes where, that are not static, so some of the objects are moving independently from the camera. So these are the kind of scenes that, that I'm most interested in. Um, so I'm going to start with a very, uh, uh, well, maybe before I start, just something I, I want to, so my, I'm a professor in 3D vision, um, so I, you know, I, I really fit to, to the theme of today in, to, in terms of 3D vision, but yeah, somehow all the things that you've been talking about this morning has made me think about, you know, Maybe I should be called 3D computer vision because it's really about computer vision what I work on. Um, anyway, a little story. So, um, so these are my kids. These are uh, 3D printed models of my kids. They're not, and and the point is that right that they're not they're not the real thing. So this is the <laughs> this is the the best the best ever. Uh, Christmas present. This was given to me as a Christmas present, and it was the best Christmas present I ever got. Right, uh, but as time goes by, you know, I was looking at these things and thinking, you know, they never move. They don't. Uh, they haven't. We haven't captured at all their their dynamics and uh, the quirky way in which they speak and they talk. And uh, so, you know, my research is much more about how can we actually capture all that? How can we actually uh, capture models of humans uh, when they're deforming? Um, and you know, if we go to industry and we see how this is, do, this is being done right now, uh, we can see that you know, th this is a technologically a very, very complex problem. And therefore, there are many shortcuts and technological solutions that have been introduced to be able to capture this deforming geometry. Um, so one of them is, of course, that you know, if we want to be able to register all these uh, deforming shapes over time, we need to be able to do data association and therefore you know, the way in which the industry has solved this problem is to put some markers on the face. It's incredibly hard to track a face unless you've got something to lock onto, right? Um, so, you know, this is one of the technological solutions that's been used at the moment. Um, another one is, of course, to capture, you know, many, many different views. So to capture the same person from many, many different views and even with lots of different illuminations. So to have, you know, not just one picture, but uh, thousands, maybe even millions of pictures of the same person um, so that we can really capture the, the texture and also the, the geometry, right? And uh, with all of this data, you can then create these super detailed models. So here you can see that we've got the, the geometry, we've got the reflectance. Um, so these are models uh, from Industrial Light and Magic. So captured in a light stage, you know, we've actually got a very, very, very accurate model of this person. But, you know, there's a few things here that obviously are, are not very, um, you know, they're not very practical. We wouldn't be able to do this ourselves. Um, so one of them is that now we've we've cr we've needed to to use many many different views. So use many many different viewpoints. We've uh, we've had to use these very complex um, studios to capture the data. We have to use a lot of data, and in the end, the models are completely personalised. So you know you might invest actually millions to create a 3D model of just one individual. So if you then wanted to scan another actor, you would have to spend that money all over again. Um, 
So, you know, what um, I've really been working on is how can we actually do this, how can we democratise this acquisition of deformable models, and how can we do this just from a single camera, um, and you know, probably just from a monocular video. So just have a, a single camera that's looking at a deforming object over time, and create very accurate 3D models. Um, so, you know, in some ways, now, often this problem can be seen as even monocular reconstruction, so reconstruction from a single frame. How can we deform maybe our current estimate of the deformable model to match the current image? And we've just got one observation of each of these shapes. That, that's the whole point. Um, so obviously, you know, maybe in 2020, the way that computer vision people think about this problem is, ah, let's throw in machine learning, right? So we've got um, deep learning, it's, uh, it's great because you've got all this data, you push it through the, the magic network, this big black box that's going to approximate your function, and out comes the 3D model. So you know, the main difficulty for solving problems with deep learning in 3D vision is that we don't actually have the labeled data, right? So, you know, who has enough images that have the 3D labels associated with them? So we can't actually solve this in a, in a completely, um, we can't solve it in a supervised way because we do not have the labels. Um, so we need to be able to function in situations where we don't have the 3D data that matches our images. So we have to think about solutions that are either semi-supervised or fully unsupervised. And this is really the theme that's going to be um, driving my talk. So, you know, very often um, in computer vision, now there are many, many problems that that are probably 2D labeling problems that you know we, we're not probably going to get much better at because we're already really really good at them. It's very very easy to harvest 2D labels for things like for instance you know annotating where the joints of a human are placed in an image. You could even give that job to a child and they'd do an amazing job probably. They would have a, a lot of fun clicking on the image and clicking where, where these 2D joints are. Um, you know, the same thing for semantic segmentation, you know, maybe that's a little bit more, um, it's a bit harder to actually create the labels, but there are all these 2D tasks in computer vision that are now pretty much solved by, um, by using um, fully supervised learning. As I said before, you know, getting 3D labels that match our, our images, uh, that's a lot harder and it's a lot more, a lot, a lot more expensive. So you know, what I'm going to talk about is how can we actually solve these 3D vision problems where we, in the case when we only have 2D labels for instance, or in the case where we don't even have any labels at all. Um, and I'm going to focus on three different problems. So the first problem I'm going to focus on is how do we reconstruct non-rigid surfaces? And in this case, you can see a phase here, but in fact, it could be any deforming object. So this algorithm is, is agnostic of the type of object uh, that's deforming. How can we reconstruct non-rigid objects um, over time? And how can we actually get very, very detailed uh, reconstructions of these objects? Um, and this is purely from a, a single <coughs> monocular stream, so an RGB, an RGB video. The second problem I'm going to focus on is how do we reconstruct the, the pose of a human in 3D from a single image. Um, so we've done faces and then the whole body, humans, and the other thing that I'm very interested in is, is whole scenes. So how do we actually look at a scene with a, with a camera um, and how can we reconstruct the, the, the trajectory of the camera at the same time as reconstructing the 3D geometry that it's observing. But as you can see now, uh, we're now actually got semantic labels associated with the object, so we can segment the objects and also associate semantic labels to them. Um, and in fact, we can also deal with scenes that are dynamic, where the objects are moving independently from the camera. Um, so this is dynamic SLAM, for those of you who, um, who, who know a bit more about this field. Um, and the idea here is to put together recognition with segmentation and also with reconstruction. Um, 
So these are the, the three areas that I'm, going to, that I'm going to talk about. So first of all, um, reconstruction of non-rigid surfaces. So this is work that we did quite a few years ago now um, with Chris, who's sitting at the back there, and some other collaborators. Um, so really what we wanted to do was to, to have a, a <coughs> monocular video. So it's just a video stream. So previously this had been done with uh, depth cameras, with RGBD cameras. And we wanted to do this in a way that we just had RGB frames. Um, and as you can see, we've got the input is just a video and the output of this is a dense, non-rigid surface that's deforming over time. Um, so how do we actually solve this problem? Um, so we start off with a template. So we assume that we have a, a few frames where the object is, is static, the object doesn't deform. And we assume that we can construct a, a 3D template. And this template also contains photometric information. So it, it also, so every vertex on the mesh has the color uh, that's associated um, with, uh, with, with that point. And obviously what we're doing over time is that we are trying to estimate this 3D warp field, which is just a collection of vectors that's going to tell us where did each of the points on the mesh go in the following frame. Um, and this is an optimization approach, um, so we're going to minimize an energy. And the energy is based on you know, what we've been using in computer vision for many, many, many years. Um, which is a photometric error. So this is the idea of brightness constancy. So if we take two consecutive frames, uh, we assume that corresponding pixels, their brightness won't change over time. Um, and this will actually allow us to estimate the deformation that will make the you know, that will, will allow us to project back the point onto the model and find the corresponding pixel that has exactly the same brightness. Um, so this is our, our data term and of course you know, we can't actually just solve this problem just with this photometric um, information. So as well we also use some priors and these priors are telling us that locally non-rigid surfaces um, deform as close to a rigid transformation, so it's close to a, just a, a single rotation. And this is something that's been used in the graphics community for a long time. This prior is called As Rigid As Possible, or ARAP. Um, and it just preserves local rigidity. We just don't expect you know, massive sort of stretchings or things like this. So it actually also preserves local detail. Um, and the other prior that we use is that we expect that spatial smoothness is going to be preserved over time as well. Um, so, you know, we have a spatial smoothness on, on the surface of the, of the object. Um, so, these are all the terms that we have and this is what the optimization looks like um, at the end. We've also got some temporal uh, prior that tells us that the deformations should not be too strong from one frame to the next. And the nice thing about this is that in the end, this is a, a big non-linear least squares um, problem that we can, you know, we can solve with, uh, with many kind of different solvers. We use Levenberg Marquardt in, in our case. Um, and to initialize at each frame, we assume that we have the deformation from the previous frame and that's how we, we initialize at every frame. Okay, so you know this is this is it. So of course, you know what we need to have as an initial estimate as well is this this template. So the initial rigid um, the, the the shape of the object, and then we are tracking the object over time. And um, as I said before, you know the nice thing about this algorithm is that we're not assuming we don't have an underlying model for the deformations, and we don't have a, an underlying model for how the shape is changing over time. So we can apply it to different types of objects, to a face. We can apply it to the the dog that you saw before. Um, we did um, also, you know, other. <laughs> Toys. I think my kids' toys featured quite strongly <laughs> in these uh, in these experiments, um, and also, you know, did the the, the tracking of, of the hand in 3D. Um, so this is very nice because just from a single video, you know, we can reconstruct this this non-rigid shape that's deforming over time. Um, however, you know, something that we with 
we thought was that we, we weren't completely exploiting all of the information that we have in the image. Um, so in the image we have a lot more information that would allow us to get even higher frequency details, right? Um, and when we went back and, and looked at this, uh, what we saw was that really the energy that we're minimizing is not really capturing the right thing. So here we're seeing, this is, this is actually a synthetically generated video where we have a 3D face, so we have the, the geometry and we've, uh, we cre we've created some albedo. Um, this is now, we've, we've actually synthesized a purely Lambertian surface, so there aren't any specularities here. And we can see now we picked a couple of points on the surface and we're looking at the brightness of that pixel over time. So we've got two different points. And we can see that brightness is not constant over time, right? So our idea of imposing brightness constancy is, is actually incorrect. And this is because the surface normals are changing over time. So we've got very strong deformations. The surface normals are changing over time. And therefore, the way that the light interacts with the surface is creating shading effects. And so, you know, this is really not what we should be imposing. If we're imposing brightness constancy, we're going to get incorrect surfaces. And this is exactly what happens if we just uh, minimize the function that you saw before, we just applied the previous algorithm, we're going to get all these artifacts on the mouth and in all the areas where the surface uh, normals are changing a lot from one frame to the next. So obviously we need to think about this problem in a, in a better way and in a more detailed way and we, we want to you know, reflect how, how the reflect, well, we're using now a better reflectance model that reflects what's really going on um, and how the intensity is created for each pixel. And um, so we're now decomposing the intensity into the product of the albedo which is the kind of intrinsic color of that um, surface point and then multiplied by the shading. And the shading, of course, is the interaction of the illumination with the, with the surface normals, with the normal directions. And we also have an additive term for the specular highlights. So now the nice thing is, I mean, on the one hand, of course, we've got more unknowns. So now we're also, um, we, we've got more unknowns and we have to estimate the illumination, the normal directions, well, the albedo and the specular highlights. But the nice thing is that now we can cope with uh, changes in normal directions, but we can also ch cope with changes in illumination, right? So if there are changes in illumination, uh, we can still capture these and we can continue to track the sequence. And of course, we can also reason about the specular highlights. So here is now the, the photometric cost that we are minimizing. Um, and now you can see some, some results that show a comparison between the original algorithm and the new one. So you can see that on the left we've synthesized a new surface where we have specular highlights. So it's a kind of plasticky surface that reflects the light more in, in these areas, for instance. And the other thing that you can see is that we've also got a light that's moving sideways, so the illumination is changing over time. So, you know, if we just impose brightness constancy, which is what you see in the center, the, the tracking goes completely wrong. But if we can decouple um, all these different factors, we can now get much, much better tracking. Okay, so, you know, this is, for me, this is, this is like really, really good old computer vision. Uh, where we are, we're solving, we're solving a problem. If you think about it, this is really solving a problem in an unsupervised way. This is just unsupervised vision, um, uh, and because we don't have any, we don't have any supervision on the 3D shape, right? The only supervision that we're giving here is that when we render the model back again with the new parameters, we've, we're expecting our photometric cost to be satisfied, right? So this is an, a, a purely unsupervised cost. Of course, the only problem here is that we've just got a single sequence. So we're kind of fitting to this sequence and that's it. And uh, one of the brilliant things you're going to see in the next two talks, um, so by um, Will and uh, Oshin, is you know, how to actually use these sort of unsupervised losses, but within you know, a, a deep learning uh, 
approach and where you can you know have many many different sequences that are contributing to estimating these these parameters okay so now just a, a nice um, video to show that you know you can even then now my, my dream of going out and capturing my children you know with just a normal camera and having a nice vivid reconstruction of them so that became true so this is one of my daughters and you can see that you know this is just a video captured in in our garden with uh, no, 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 no special lighting or anything and now we can reconstruct the surfaces and and uh, and get very nice accurate geometry okay so now I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about, you know, how can you, how can we uh, apply this for, for something, um, something interesting. And, um, you know, now I'm going to put my sort of entrepreneurship and commercial hat on and tell you a bit about, you know, our kind of new adventure into um, starting up a company where we're using this technology uh, for something quite exciting. So, you know, the idea is, is, is based on the fact that, that from video we can create these accurate 3D models, in this case of faces, um, and you know, we can track, we can turn a video basically into a 3D model of a person, um, and track very accurately the motion, the motion of the lips, the motion of the whole face. Um, and what we're working on is on video synthesis. So the idea is that we have a, an input video. Um, and what we want to do is we want to modify that video so that maybe the motion of the, of the, of the face of the person is new, right? And we're going to drive this with another video. So the idea here is that, you know, imagine, for instance, that you have a person who is talking in, in one language, so you have a, uh, you have a, a video that's, uh, that's it's, uh, recorded in, in, a, in a certain language, and suppose that you want to translate it into a new language. This one's in English, and this one, uh, you, want it, you want to dub it into Portuguese. So what normally happens when you do dubbing is that the only thing that's dubbed is the, is the, is the actual voice. You have a new voice in the new language, and the original video, the person is still talking in the previous language, and it's horrible for those of you who've grown up in European countries uh, where dubbing is, is happening all the time. It's, it's really, um, it's not very nice. Um, so what we're doing is that we are tracking also the voice actor. We're reconstructing 3D models of both, of the source actor and, um, and, the, uh, and the final actor, the target actor. And then we're transferring the motion from one to the other one and resynthesizing the video. Um, so maybe I'll show you. I hope, yeah. I'd like to demonstrate how Synthesia technology can make me speak 7,100 languages fluently. Why don't we rewind this video and I'll show off my language skills. Sorry, let me just see if I, can I, can I turn down the volume, do you think? No. Can you, can you just oh, turn here, here, here. Yeah, I can. Just, can you just no, turn? no, that one doesn't work, but... How Synthesia technology can make me speak 7,100 languages fluently. Why don't we rewind this video and I'll show off my language skills. Nous vivons dans un monde plus connecté que jamais. Mais la langue reste un frein, surtout lorsqu'il s'agit de compter les vidéos. Ça,我们可以用中文语去和自己的粉丝沟通，又或者说你翻译的内容帮你打开了一个新的市场。Eu gostaria de demonstrar como a tecnologia Synthesia me permite falar 7100 idiomas fluentemente. Por que não te retrocedemos este vídeo e eu lhe mostrarei as minhas competências linguísticas? Ok, so you, you, you get the idea. So we're transferring the motion and obviously at the end, you know, we also have um, we need to use um, deep learning. In this case, we're using generative adversarial networks, GANs, to generate the final, final video. So, but, but you know, the idea is that with the 3D tracking, uh, we can render 
the model in the new image and now it's, it's kind of pixel perfect really so we're projecting the pixels onto the right place so that then you know the GAN is, is already, it's already working with a completely registered image. Um, and just to show a little bit more about it, I'll just show you this, this was a, a video that we, so that we did for the Malaria No More campaign um, with, uh, with David Beckham and you know you can see that we're dubbing this into many different languages. <coughs> Malaria isn't just any disease, it's the deadliest disease there's ever been. Se dice que ha matado más de la mitad de la población que ha existido. Mais nous pouvons y mettre fin. Nous savons comment, nous en avons la possibilité. Malaria. Speak up and say, Malaria must die. One voice can be powerful, but all of our voices together, then they will have to listen. Malaria must die, so millions can live. Okay, so, I mean, as probably m most of you know, um, David Beckham doesn't speak all those languages. <laughs> um, and and these, these are the people who actually um, <coughs> spoke those languages. Um, so right now, you know, the technology that we, that we are developing and that we're selling is, is we still need to track the voice actor. So we, we, we're tracking both the source actor and the target actor. Um, and then, you know, as I said before, we're transferring the motion in the 3D models, re-rendering um, and, uh, and doing some, some GAN stuff there to, uh, to fill in the, the areas, for instance, the, in, the inside of the mouth, which has, has changed and that we're not modeling. Um, and some of the things that we're working on right now is that, um, you know, something that we've ignored so far is the audio, right? So the way that a person speaks is also a really incredible cue to find out, you know, how the voice is move, how the mouth is moving, but also find out about the uh, facial expressions, maybe the emotions of the person. Um, so this is, you know, something that we're working on right now, doing uh, audio to video or even text to video. Um, so this is, uh, this is part of the team. Um, and okay, it's a really exciting direction in which I'm, you know, I'm really enjoying putting into practice some of the uh, some of the work that we've been doing for for so many years. Um, so the next part of my talk is going to be about estimating the pose of humans from a single image, um, and I realise that I'm going to have to go fairly quickly through this bit and the next part. Um, so, as I said at the beginning, really, um, so our intention was to try and build a, a system to do 3D human pose estimation um, that doesn't need to have 3D labels for the 3D skeletons. So we don't need to have associated images with 3D skeletons. We don't want to have those 3D labels. Um, because you know this is one of the one of the the ways in which you can solve this problem. So you can have a, a neural network, or you know may, maybe another machine learning algorithm here, and you have pairings of images with the 3D skeletons, and then you know you train this network um, to then be able to regress directly the skeletons from the images. Now the problem with this is that it's very difficult to have these um, these 3D labels. And typically the kinds of images for which we have got annotations like this are images that have been taken in mocap studios. So when you then show the system an image that's been captured in the wild is not going to generalize very well. So a different way to solve this problem is to say, well, we'll divide this into two steps. The first step is a 2D estimation problem where we're trying to estimate the positions of the, label of the uh, joints in 2D. And then we have a 2D to 3D lifting algorithm. So we throw away completely the image and then we're just going from 2D to 3D and we solve this as a geometric problem. 
Okay, so what we, um, what we actually thought about was, you know, why do we actually throw away the image at this stage? I mean, these two problems should actually be solved jointly. And perhaps what we should be doing is making the most of this, of this step to improve the estimation of the 2D joints. And this is what, uh, what our work was about. So our work was about starting off with an image and being reasoning both in 2D and in 3D. So solving the problem of estimating the 2D joints, but going through 3D in the process so that we can improve both. And this is a, a paper that we had in CBPR uh, 17 called Lifting from the Deep. That's the one that you could remember earlier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true, the other one as well, yeah. Um, it's a, a cool, uh, a cool title. It was, it, I think, it was Chris's idea to come up with this, with this title. Um, so the main idea here is, as I said before, that you know we normally have 2D joint annotations for images, and there are many, many data sets that that give us this for real world images, for in the wild images. And then at the same time, you know, there's there's tons and tons of 3D mocap data. So just 3D mocap data, not necessarily associated or aligned with the images. Um, so the idea is to use these two independent sources of training data and not to need to have them um, together. So to have images with 3D labels. Um, so the way that, that, that our algorithm works is that, you know, this would be like a, a 2D pose estimation algorithm where we have, uh, we have some annotations on the positions of the joints in 2D, so the loss would be on the positions of those 2D joints. Right, so we actually took um, uh, an existing system called convolutional pose machines, and what we did was that once we, once we had those estimates of the 2D poses, we actually lifted them into 3D using a 2D to 3D lifting algorithm, um, and then, because we were also estimating the pose of the camera, we could project them back onto the image. So now we've got another set of, of, uh, of, belief, uh, of belief maps of where the 2D uh, joints are. And then what we did was combine these two and to have a loss on the combination of these, um, of these different belief maps. So we fused them, so did a, a weighted combination of the two. Um, so as you can see, you know, we have a 2D loss. We're only using a 2D loss here. We're not, we don't need to have a, a 3D loss. And this part that you see here, the 2D to 3D lifting, is an unsupervised uh, method. And, um, and the nice thing about it is that it was differentiable so that we could put it within, the, within this network. So you know, this is the algorithm. We're using a probabilistic model for the 3D pose. And we can go from 2D landmarks um, to 3D pose by solving this optimization. Um, OK, so these are some of the results. Um, and this is the, the, the classic human 3.6M algorithm. So here the pose is being estimated per frame. There's no, um, there's no temporal smoothness happening. So you can see really that the reconstructions are, are very accurate. Um, and the other nice thing that we got out of this algorithm was that the estimates of the, of the 2D positions were also improving because we were solving both things simultaneously. So if you only run a 2D estimation algorithm or if you run it with our 3D lifting followed by reprojection, then we were improving also on the, on the 2D estimates. Um, and of course, at the time we were we were top of the list in the human 3.6M data set. This is obviously no longer the case, but um, it was nice to have at the time when we were submitting the paper. Um, and this is to show that you know we could actually apply this to um, in the wild images and get some very nice estimates of the of the 3D of the 3D pose. And this is, you know, a much more in the wild experiment where, so we, I, th at the moment I, I have an e EU project with some partners who work in robotics and we have a robot that's in a warehouse looking at people while they're performing ma maintenance tasks. And as you can see, you know, this is a, 
a really ugly environment. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of noise, there's a, a lot of clutter, and we're still able to detect the person and reconstruct in 3D without really needing any 3D annotations. Um, okay, so then the last thing about this method is that something that we realized is that we could turn this also into a self-supervised or we could use self-supervised learning as well. Um, so if we had um, part of the data set for which we didn't have any 2D labels for instance, so we had some extra images without any 2D labels, we could also introduce a, a, a self-supervised loss that would say that the predicted belief maps before and after reprojection should actually be exactly the same. So here the nice thing is that we don't need those 2D labels anymore. We can, we can even add an extra corpus of data for which we, we don't have any annotations at all and improve the system. And this, you know, we showed that, that it, it could improve the, the, the reconstruction even more. Okay, so we've looked at you know faces and humans, um, and the last thing that I want to talk about is is scenes. So now we have you know we're looking at a camera that's moving along an environment, and what we want to do is reconstruct the scene in 3D, uh, but we want to do this in a semantic way, in which we can segment individual objects and we can add semantic labels to those objects. And we also want that algorithm to be able to cope with dynamic scenes where the objects uh, might be moving independently from the camera. Um, so what we've done here is that we've leveraged um, so the well enormous advances in computer vision in uh, instance level semantic segmentation. So this is uh, just an example of mask RCNN. Uh, working on a on a on a scene where we have you know we have a desk and we have a few different objects, and you can see this is what modern computer vision can give us. You know, for a 2D image, we can have really good detections of objects um, with the labels and se segmentation masks as well. So the idea. Um, our, our ideas, you know, can we actually use this input information, these segmentation masks, can we incorporate this into a 3D SLAM system so that we can track the position of the camera, reconstruct the 3D world and have these annotated objects as well. Um, and these are the kind of reconstructions that we're looking at, right? So I must say that in this case we're not using just a simple RGB camera, this is an RGBD camera. So at the moment we still can't do it without the depth, um, but we're certainly working on that. Um, so if you look at the current literature in computer vision and you look at how people are doing semantic 3D scene understanding right now, um, it's typically a, a different way of solving this problem. Typically you will go around the room and you scan the room in advance. So you have you know, a complete 3D model of the room and then the network is actually, uh, it's actually going, to be, uh, look, it's going to be doing 3D convolutions over the voxels and the annotations are actually like this, you know, they're, they're, 3D, they're 3D annotations. Um, so the whole problem is actually solved in, in 3D. Now, the problem is that obtaining these annotations is, is really extremely expensive. So, as I said before, what we really wanted to do was to, you know, to go back to this idea of saying how, how much can we push all these 2D annotations that, you know, we, we're already very good at in, in computer vision without having to annotate specific scenes in 3D, which is very, very costly. Um, and, you know, just to go back again, this is something that we're using in the context of robotics. Um, so the other thing that's important to us is to be able to deal with dynamic scenes. So here you can see what happens if we employ a traditional SLAM system in a scene that's dynamic. So you can see that, you know, these uh, boxes are moving. Um, and if we use a traditional system to solve this problem, typically what will happen is that those boxes will be detected as outliers and the system just throws all those measurements away and will only reconstruct the parts of the scene that are non-static, that are static, sorry, that uh, they're not dynamic, they're not moving. So we're kind of missing all the action basically. And what we're interested in is, is the things that are, that are moving and the things that are happening. 
Um, and this is really what we want to achieve, to be able to reconstruct each of these individual boxes as individual uh, objects. So we have a SLAM system that takes uh, one frame, so it's, it, it works on a frame by frame basis. We track the objects that we already have. Um, we then perform segmentation in the image and given the segmentation, if we see that a new object has appeared, then we'll spawn a new 3D model for that particular object. It will be included into the map and we start tracking it independently. So we're still doing tracking and fusion and alternating between these two things or tracking and reconstruction but we also have this segmentation step in the middle so that we can reason about the different objects and of course the segmentation can be based on different cues so this segmentation could for instance be just motion segmentation where we're not reasoning about the semantics we could say what's moving differently from the camera detect those pixels and then reconstruct them independently or we could use segmentation, uh, semantic segmentation or other different cues. So it's a, it's a very kind of generic system. So here's a, our, our first system where we were working with um, motion segmentation only. So we were detecting pixels that were moving independently from the camera and we were reconstructing them as a, as a different object. Um, but of course here we don't have a sense that this is a chair, for instance, so this is why we, we then moved on to using uh, semantic segmentation. Okay, so here's another example where we have different objects that are moving, they're being segmented and reconstructed in real time. Okay, and now, you know, if we then perform semantic segmentation instead, so we get these masks and the nice thing is that now these masks also have a meaning, right? So now we know that all these voxels here are a bottle, this is a teddy bear, this is a keyboard, so then you know we could give this to a robot and they could reason about the environment with, with semantic information in, at hand. Um, So something that we're not doing right now is that um, when we're reconstructing the objects, we are actually throwing away these semantic labels. So we're just doing the process of reconstruction as a geometric reconstruction. So what we're working on right now is to actually use those, um, those, uh, those shape priors in the reconstruction itself. So if we recognize that this is a teddy bear, we might have you know, a data set of, of 3D shapes of teddy bears and we know how the, what the shape of, of the teddy bear is like and we're working with you know, deep learning approaches to learning embeddings of the shapes of objects, so using things like, uh, like deep SDF um, and then we can actually also incorporate learning into the reconstruction. Okay, so we've looked at these three problems and you know, in conclusion, um, my takeaway message is that yes, deep learning is, is, is very useful, but it's still, when we use it for 3D vision, it's still really in its infancy. I don't think that we have um, really extracted all the, all the potential uh, that it has. Um, 3D annotations are very, very, very hard to come by and therefore using 2D labels or maybe even using unsupervised approaches is really the, the, the way to go. And you're going to see, as I said before, two really good examples of how to use these um, unsupervised frameworks uh, for doing 3D vision uh, in, the next, uh, in the next two talks. And for me, what's next is, is really about, you know, we, we very often we're very constrained in, in how we use 3D vision. Um, you know, we, we, we can do faces really well, as you've seen before. We can do the human body really well. Um, but, you know, how about a, a real 3D world scene in which um, a human is actually interacting with objects? It's picking up objects. It's giving it an object to another person. People are interacting with each other. They're maybe touching each other. You know, we're making so many different assumptions that simplify our problem that, you know, we still have a lot to solve to actually go towards 3D vision for, for the real world. Um, so that is, is the, the next task that we should be looking at. 
Um, and then of course, um, yeah, I'd like to thank the people who, who did all the hard work and the, and the funding agencies as well. And yeah, that's it, thank you. <laughs>